All right. So first off, R.I.P. Miss Lou, damn it, because that was brutal. Poor Kenny, man. Can't catch a damn break. But of course, we'll get into all the details more in depth later in the video because I want to take this slow. So there's time to let it sink in, you know. But I must say, that is the right way to start off season three. That is hands down the best season premiere we've gotten so far. And I loved it. But anyway, let's get into it. So we literally picked things off right back up where they left off from with Tabitha waking up in the hospital. And we finally find out that she's in Camden, Maine, which if you've been searching around the web in between seasons, then you would definitely have seen this online. But this definitely feels like a nod to Stephen King, who has previously expressed his love for the show since the first season. And on top of that, the vast majority of Stephen King's novels and short stories have been set in Maine. And with the show like From, I doubt that was just a coincidence. But of course, Tabitha is still confused here, just like the rest of us, as they tell her the police are on the way. Because since she was found on the side of a trail all banged up without any identification, they need to make sure no foul play was involved. So anyway, of course, Tabitha isn't about to wait around and tell the cops some crazy shit about how she was stuck in a town full of monsters and magically ended up in Maine. So fair enough, she sneaks out. After she leaves, she sees a familiar face across the street, just waving at her. And it's that little bastard that shoved her out the window, the boy in white. Now, <laughs> at this point it's not clear if the boy in white is evil or not but it does seem like he's trying to help more than not so that's what we'll continue to stick with for now is that he's mostly good she goes to run after him almost getting herself killed and follows him into a nearby restaurant she walks in and of course he's nowhere to be found she sees a little boy that looks like him but damn it tabby the boy was wearing white shorts <laughs> so obviously this isn't him but the tricky thing that happens here is that when she first walks in the boy is wearing white shorts and looks like the boy in white but after they cut away and tabitha approaches him it's just some kid who looks like him and tabitha realizes she's still tripping balls then we cut back to the town to check in on boyd and subconscious father Cotry, which is probably what i might start calling him subconscious father Cotry. We'll, we'll see but we see boyd patching up the shotgun wound from last season from the shit reggie did then they continue to discuss how things in the town are becoming worse how people are still afraid to sleep, uh, how that bitch Reggie tried to kill him, also the food shortage and the fact that it's getting cold, which is just bad for a lot of reasons. Boyd goes on to tell subconscious Katri how the Abbey in the chamber who was trying to convince him to give up wasn't his wife. Then he asks subconscious Katri, what is he? And Katri responds by telling Boyd that he can't answer that for him. And honestly, this does raise the question once again about what the hell is this version of Father Katri? I mean, is it the town trying to gain Boyd's trust through subconscious Katri? Or is this all in Boyd's head and it's just solely him trying to find all alternative ways to mentally cope with all the misfortune. At this time outside the station, Boyd can overhear Ethan trying to fight off Miss Lou. Ethan has been trying to run his little ass out into the woods to search for his mom because right now Ethan feels like Jim isn't doing enough to look for their mom. So basically Jim gets the bright idea to head out into the woods alone to look for her. Although Boyd has already made it clear that there's some weird shit out there that he experienced with Sarah and how he just barely made it back. But of course Jim is still set on heading out. So during this time Kenny walks in and Boyd tells Jim how there's probably a safer way to do this. During this time, we cut over to Fatima throwing up over at Colony House, and at the moment, things just seem to look like regular morning sickness with her. Some background unknown chick Nikki is banging on the door to get in the bathroom, and reveals in this moment that she's sour about Fatima getting double rations. But it's only right because she's eating for two now. I mean, she's pregnant, so new girl can just f*** off. Or at least I think she's new, because I've never seen her before. I don't remember seeing her. Because I feel like they normally swap out background Colony House people who don't have speaking roles roles. I mean, because there's really no reason to keep track of them unless they have a bigger role throughout the episodes. So at this time, Ellis rolls up during Nikki's meltdown and tries to console Fatima. Even Tilly offers some kind words about the first couple of months being hard, but we already know that this ain't no regular pregnancy. The woman isn't supposed to have the ability to get pregnant, so we already know that something ominous is coming here with Fatima. Now in this moment, Donna goes and gets Ellis to help her with harvesting before it gets too cold and kills the remaining crops. And on their way out, we see Elgin wandering around like a sleepless zombie since he's still too afraid to go back to sleep because of the creepy mystery ghost lady he keeps seeing. <laughs> Ah! 
Back over at Kenny's place, Boyd gives Jim a heads up on the talisman hut out in the woods as a safety base to help search the area. In this moment, Kenny decides that he wants to tag along to assist Jim. Boyd tries to talk him out of it, but he's pretty set in stone about it. Then all of a sudden, they're interrupted by some shit that comes flying through a window over at the bar. And here's where we find our boy Jade still slowly sinking into chaos and madness over this damn mysterious symbol. And Boyd's like, let's just take him back to the station so I can keep an eye on him. Back in the real world, Tabitha comes across some sort of outdoor flea market vintage cell where she asks Ask these two random girls if she can borrow one of their phones and of course we all know that that's a big no-no in the real world because of all this damn theft and scams out here nobody's really trusting you with their phone anymore these days <laughs> i mean even one of the girls even says no but one of them is nice enough to allow it it would definitely be a hell no for me too though, I'm just saying. But anyway, Tabitha actually gives her mom a call and tells her that she loves her and how she just wanted to hear her voice. Her mom tells her that everyone has been looking for her, which confirms the missing posters that we saw earlier from the series social media teams and how they are proof of what's been happening in the real world. Because I know some of you guys have been asking about that, so there you go. After the phone call, Tabitha wanders off confused until she hears some church bells in the distance. Then we cut back to the town at the diner where Kenny's mom is sending him off with a little care package. And she tells him how she wishes that he would stay. And of course this moment feels very ominous. Like we already know something crazy is on the horizon. This is Lou's death. Then we cut over to Kenny's place where we see Ethan working on a puzzle that looks somewhat similar to the area in Maine where Tabitha currently is. Now, I don't know, that's just a guess, but it does kind of look like Camden a little bit. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was a little Easter egg. During this time, Jim is saying his goodbyes to Julie and Ethan before he heads out to look for Tabitha. Once outside, we see Boyd telling Kenny about the spider webs and how seeing them is confirmation that he's going the right way. Then Jim and Kenny proceed to head out. Afterwards, Ellis runs to get Boyd to tell him how all the crops at Colony House are now rotten. During this time, Boyd asks Donna how many people currently know about the rotten crops, because of course he wants to keep this quiet so they don't have to now deal with an angry mob on their hands. Over at Kenny's place, <laughs> we now cut to the angry mob, where Miss Lou is desperately trying to keep them from eating every ounce of food they have left, since what's left is apparently being stored at her place. But unfortunately, she is unsuccessful at keeping the angry mob away. And you know, I think Miss Lou definitely should have had a gun to scare off these assholes. I mean, firing it off in the air once would have cleared out that crowd, but you know, it is what it is. And then over at the barn, Randall just decides that he's having goat tonight by stealing Ethan's favorite goat, Elma. Which, when the hell did this happen? I have no clue. Now, I'm assuming this could have been resolved by Randall just taking a different goat. Of course, this is just a joke, but there is some logic to it because would he have had a problem with Randall taking a different goat? just curious in this moment the second most manly man in town behind boyd steps up to let randall know he ain't taking shit so victor pulls out his handy dandy pistol because he don't have time for no damn fighting and tussling <laughs> then boyd rolls up just in time to save randall from a swift death and saves miss goat too in the process out in the woods with Jim and Kenny, they come across those creepy scarecrow figures that we remember from the trailer, and there turns out to be a trail of them that leads to that weird village we all seen from the trailer. And it turns out that that thing that sort of looked like the tower in the background behind the village was just a tree. For those of you who saw my trailer breakdown, you'll know what I mean. So Jim and Kenny go to check out the village and Jim decides that he wants to sleep here tonight. Although Kenny points out the fact that they probably went the wrong way. And also I got a comment on this. I don't really like how this has never been found by anyone else currently in the town up to this point, considering the fact that it didn't seem like Jim and Kenny traveled very far from town. I mean, it seemed like this place probably was only like five minutes away. And I'm just basing that off of what time it looks like it was when they left versus what time it looks like it was when they got there. But whatever, of course there's arguments for opposing views as well, which I'm sure I'll see down in the comments, but that's just my opinion. Back in the real world at the church confessional, Tabitha tries to seek guidance from a priest. She blames God for her son Thomas's death and for creating the town. But Tabitha needs to quit with that because her son Thomas's death was technically her and Jim's fault for being pretty careless. I know that's cold, but it is what it is. But of course, this is just her having a hard time. She tells the priest about the town and going through the tree at the risk of sounding like a complete psycho. Then she begins to tell him about Victor. And while telling him about Victor, she notices Victor's address in his lunchbox. And holy shit, it says 1597 Borough Street, Camden, Maine. So the tree sent Tabitha to Victor's hometown. And the really interesting part is, would she still have ended up there if Victor hadn't given her the lunchbox? Hmm, 
I mean, I really feel like the item played a major role in her ending up there. And you gotta remember, the trees are temperamental. So maybe the trees also have some sort of voodoo magic involved, where the tree automatically knows who the items belong to that you have on you or some kind of weird shit like that who knows that's just a wild theory that i wanted to throw out there then at colony house elgin and tilly are chilling while elgin is still fighting sleep in this moment tilly sees the creepy ghost lady standing behind elgin and then the shit gets wild i mean bat shit crazy but it's revealed that elgin is only dreaming props to the series though for getting a better budget to have these better looking visual effects i really like what they got going on Props to the production team. Over at Kenny's place, Boyd, Donna, and Miss Lou are trying to figure out what they need to do about food now that everyone has stole everything. As they're trying to come up with a plan on how to feed everyone, Boyd is curious to know how much time slaughtering the goats would buy them. But Ethan walks in all upset to overhear them talking about the damn goats. And Ethan's like, I know my goat friend has to die. Just make sure you kill her first so she don't have to watch her friends die. And I must admit, that response was very unexpected and actually pretty mature. But Ethan has shown some level of maturity sometimes. Back in the real world with Tabitha, she finally arrives at Victor's house. And Victor's dad rolls up and he's like, where the hell did you get that lunchbox? Back in the village with Jim and Kenny, Jim's crazy ass tells Kenny that he was right about them going the wrong way since they didn't see any giant spider webs like the ones Boyd mentioned before they left. You know, <laughs> Jim gets on my damn nerves sometimes. While inside the village houses, they begin to hear twigs cracking outside like someone's walking around out there. But of course they are safe because they have the talisman, so everything's all good. At this point, Jim is basically beginning to regret the whole trip because he figures if Tabitha is dead, she wouldn't want him out there looking for her and risking both of them not being there for their kids. But unfortunately, it took him going out and getting lost to come to this conclusion. Wow. Back in town, we see the monsters doing something that makes you think, why haven't they done this before? Which is they open the fence and barn door and release the livestock as a way to lure everyone outside. Because of course, that is the only food they have left. And it's kind of funny how the monsters are never around during the day, but they're always aware of what's going on above ground in the town. Now, of course, hopefully that'll get explained later, but you never know. During this time over at the station, we finally get to see Boyd's Parkinson's disease again which weirdly enough wasn't mentioned or hinted at not once throughout season two. It's like the writers forgot they ever gave Boyd the disease, but whatever. Jade finally wakes up and Boyd asked him what's going on with him. Finally, someone's asking questions about someone, but Jade says he's not ready to talk about it yet. So, so much for anyone sharing anything at least between these two anyway. At this time, Boyd hears the damn cows outside and sees them walking the streets. And him and Jade run out together to try to catch them before they escape. In this moment, Victor looks outside from Mrs. Lou's place and him and Miss Lou run outside to help Boyd and Jade, leaving Julie and Ethan inside the place alone. And at the same time, Randall hears everyone outside and notices that the monsters are approaching from behind the houses. So he honks the bus horn to alert everyone that they're coming. And with perfect timing while all of this is happening, Ethan looks out the window and sees the damn pet goat just happen to be passing the house at the same time he's looking out the window and opens the door. So that's why Ethan opened the damn door in the trailer for his damn pet goat that I don't think we've ever seen him hang around or even heard about until this season. I'll let this slide though because he is a kid and even adults will do crazy shit for their pets, but it still would have made more sense for us to see this connection he had with this animal before this season, so it could feel a little more justified in my opinion. And although Grin and Gary was a creepy monster, Creepy Monster Grandma still holds the title for being the most creepiest monster in all of the series in my opinion. And the monster transformation we get to see here is just awesome. I mean, I love it. Julie and Ethan escape out the back and run into Sarah, just like we've already seen in the trailers, and they run off and hide in the bushes from Creepy Grandma. Back with Boyd and the others, Jade gets cornered by the Milkman and a couple of other creepy monsters, and the Milkman just slaughters the damn cow to get over to Jade. It was ridiculous. And Jade is just standing there shocked as shit, but luckily Victor runs up to snap him out of it. And I gotta say, Victor has just seriously bossed up since we last saw him in the caves with Tabitha, like, holy shit, he's like a superhero in this season premiere. So anyway, Sarah, Julie, and Ethan are able to run to safety with Randall on the bus. Boyd tells Victor to get as many animals in the bar as possible, and Jade goes to help him. Miss Lou is just standing there like, what the f should I go do? So she decides that she's going to go help Boyd, and he tries to tell her to go back, but she insists on helping him. 
So her death is kind of her own fault as far as I'm concerned. That's pretty cold, I know, but I'm just saying. So Boyd and Miss Lou make it to the barn, but turns out this was the ambush that Boyd was talking about in the trailer. Some of the monsters waited in the barn for them to return with the livestock, which was a clever plan on their part, I must admit. And from here, unfortunately, Boyd is forced to watch as they torture the hell out of Miss Lou. They even proceed to snatch a piece of her scalp off, like Jesus. And then they proceed to mutilate her as Boyd watches. And this episode just goes off with her just screaming in pain as the credits are playing. Like, holy shit. Definitely the best season premiere we've gotten since the show started, for sure. I feel like this episode was a real nice way to set the tone to let us fans know the type of hell and chaos we get to look forward to this season. There was a lot of surprising moments, I gotta say, but y'all gotta let me know down below what was the most shocking moment from the premiere for y'all. Besides Miss Lou getting tortured and getting her scalp snatched out, of course. I'd say the one for me was the way they killed the damn cow. That turned out to be surprisingly way more graphic than I was expecting. All the flailing and blood splattering really justified Jay's expression in that moment. They are truly stepping up their game this season, so <laughs> let's just see what happens. But as always, I appreciate you guys and thanks for watching.